Most people tend to focus on where did you go to school? What was your application? Um, show me the body of work that you've done. M my interest is more in, tell me about a project that you've collaborated on. Talk to me a little bit more about the process that you used. Episode 135. This is the business of architecture. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you believe that it's possible to make money and do good, then this is the show for you. If you aren't already on the Business of Architecture email list, make sure you claim your free account on businessofarchitecture.com by clicking the green Join Today button. I'm your host, Enix Sears. Today's show is sponsored by BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the office and project management software built with the needs of architects in mind. And for a limited time, startup firms can get two free seats of ArchiOffice for a year. Go check it out at ArchiOffice.com. Today's guest is a business strategist and coach for the AEC industry who's been the director of business development and Director of Marketing for Small Companies, Mid-Sized Multi-Office Firms, and International Corporations. Karen Compton is the Principal of A3K Consulting. She focuses on helping firms with under 50 employees increase revenues and market share by taking a strategic focus. Karen, welcome to Business of Architecture. I am excited to be here. Nice to see you again. So we talked, you mentioned that you're located down in Southern California, but you do have clients nationwide. Any, yes. Where, where, where are your clients kind of located? Our clients are pretty much a, come across the board in a national platform. Um, they usually tend to be architects, engineers, contractors, or construction managers. We don't, we don't advise a lot of interiors firms, but we have in the past. Our typical firm uh, is usually somewhere between the Midwest and the West, um, but we've had clients in Florida and Maryland. They're typically on the order of about no more than about 50 employees, um, usually between 25 and 50. All of them are in some form of transition, whether that's ownership or leadership development. Um, they're in some form of, of not necessarily growth. I think the proper word really is truly transition because some of our clients really don't want to grow anymore. Some mm -hmm. of them want to be smaller. Some of them want to reposition where they are. And so it's a point of convergence for them. And so we basically service the AEC space. You know, when we were when we hopped on here just just a couple minutes ago, we were talking about a program that you're working with, uh, Southern California Edison. Uh huh. Um, let's let's continue that conversation. I thought that was kind of interesting. So you're talking about one of your clients that you work with. Yes. So Southern California Edison has what they call Southern California Edison University. It's basically a mentor and coaching program. And what they do is they work with uh, their procurement department to identify small businesses that are working within the Edison space that really truly need business support. Edison's philosophy is that you can be a great vendor, but we really want to hire great businesses. And what they have found over time is that most of the small businesses that do work with them, and I would dare say it's true for almost any public agency or quasi-agency, is that they're, they're good on, on the technical side of what they do, whether that's engineering or architectural design, uh, whatever that happens to be. But where the challenges tend to be and where the failures tend to come in is on the practice side, where we don't usually tend to spend a lot of time. So those tend to be more in the area of human resource management, finance, business development, and marketing. And so in this 18-month uh, program, Edison assigns each small business a coach, of which I am one. I have three firms, I believe, this year. Last year I had two. And on a quarterly basis, we really kind of first identify where their existing condition is. Where are they having challenges? Where are they experiencing issues? Uh, if they can even articulate those. And then over a period of 18 months, we work to try and identify areas of improvement, whether that's in hiring practices, whether that's in marketing or business development, whether it's in cash or cash management. And then we provide them with that ongoing coaching, mentorship, and development 
in that process over that 18 to 18 month period, sometimes it runs a little bit longer, they'll meet with what, what Edison calls the business unit or the BU or OU operating unit. And at that point, the intent is for the operating unit to actually see that the firms have progressed to the point of being able to do more work, different work, have capacity, don't have capacity, have bandwidth, or, or where they can actually try and support them better so that they're so that they're not just saying here here's a contract but really giving them tools to actually um, do well in the long term and be sustainable so you're saying that a company like California Edison they actually want to do business with other providers or vendors that actually run a good business absolutely and I think honestly it's probably one of the best models I've ever worked under because it's not about contracts. It's not about here, let me give you a contract. It's about here, let me make you a sustainable business. And if in the process of making you a sustainable business, you can do more work with Edison, that's awesome. But the truth is, is that by making you a better business, you can do business with anybody whether it's in Visalia, whether it's the city of Glendale, whether it's in Burbank, whether it's a transportation agency, the tools that, that they give uh, through this mentorship program and that we actually do as part of my core business are really designed to make people sustainable, no matter what agent they do work, do work for. So, so you're talking about, okay, this is a great business model that Southern California Edison has. You know, what's in it for Edison? to spend these resources to help these professional services firms improve their businesses? Why, why do they even care about that? That's actually a really good question. So several years ago, Edison kind of took a look at the performance of their small businesses. And they realized that in some cases, they were entering into contracts with small businesses that were um, beyond their capacity to actually do work. So what would ultimately happen is Edison would then end up having to either cancel the contract or the work, if let's say the, the work was uh, as a subconsultant, the work then ended up having to be absorbed by the prime consultant, which was never really the intent. So from Edison's perspective, if they're going to invest in and engage in small businesses, they want the businesses to be able to do the work. They don't see the benefit in having to take work from a small firm, give it to a large firm, or have it reabsorbed back into the agency, that creates inefficiency on their part. And so from their perspective as a business and as a business case, they said, look, it's actually more cost effective for us to invest time and resources in the development of a company so that they are long-term sustainable. It not only creates capacity for the firm, it creates efficiency for Edison by not having to stop work or, or remove work. Um, and that, that's incredibly important, especially for a utility agency. I mean, well, that's really interesting. It's it's something that's come up here on the show before, which is that other other businesses want to do business with businesses that run a great business. Yeah, it's really about be it's really about being in business with another great business, and I think that's why Jim Collins' book Good to Great was so important for people, is because they understood. I can be a good business or I can be a great business, but it's really the great businesses that people want to engage with. It's it, And that's the bottom line. Well, Karen, tell me how you got into this business yourself. Let's talk about your journey a little bit here. <laughs> that's a journey in and of itself. That's a book. Yeah. Um, I actually have a bachelor's degree in chemistry and um, actually started out in the hazardous waste industry in the early 1990s. And if you remember correctly, or maybe you're not even that old, uh, in the 90s, the environmental industry actually tanked. And uh, I was doing a lot of business. I was doing a lot of hazardous waste closures, soil remediation, groundwater remediation um, at that particular point in time for very large firms that you probably know very well. And uh, the industry tanked. One of my largest clients actually told me point blank, and I was, I was young, young, very young, uh, told me point blank it was easier for them to pay the EPA fine per day than to remediate what they had messed up. And for me, that was kind of shocking, um, to, not only to, to my own social core, it was just shocking that people would make that as a business decision. Mm -hmm. 
And so at that point, I didn't really know what to do. I had kind of a focus on in, in the environmental space. And I had a really good friend of mine come to me and say, look, I think you probably need to go and work for a general contractor. And I said, well, why a contractor? And they said, because they're trying to build on these things called brown fields and they don't really know what they are. And I said, well, it's not a mystery. This is Southern California. Everything is a brown field. So I left environmental in the, probably by this point, it's the mid 1990s, uh, late 1990s and worked for a general contractor. And uh, basically over the last 20 plus years of my career have gone backward in the design and construction process. I went from working for a general contractor to working for a very large national engineering firm. Uh, I was an owner's rep for the water district here in Southern California to administer their small business program at one point in time. And then subsequent to that went to architecture and spent the last uh, four years of my career in somebody else's practice within architecture. And it was, it was actually kind of a serendipitous experience. I had a, a very good colleague of mine say, why don't you come to architecture? And I said, I'm an engineer by education and training. Why do I care about architecture? And he was very sincere. He said, you know, it'll give you an opportunity to have a well-rounded perspective. And I kind of stopped and thought about it. And I thought, you know what? He's absolutely right. You know, I've been on the environmental side. I've been on the construction side, construction management side. Architecture was the piece that I was last missing. And so I spent four years uh, in architecture at that point and uh, really enjoyed my time in architecture. I was given an opportunity to work on a much larger scale. And we had children, very young children at that point. And uh, it just was, really wasn't feasible for me to kind of stay and do a, a much broader kind of statewide role at that point. And what I had really come to realize is that in, in the space in which I occupied, which at that point was primarily marketing and business development, that you can sell your heart out, but if you can't deliver the work, if the practice end on the back end for which I had absolutely no control, um, isn't going well, then I can keep selling, but you can't keep delivering. It burns people out. It burns out relationships. It creates a poor reputation. And so at that point, I just decided, you know, I really would rather focus on the business, you know, the business of architecture, the business of engineering. And um, I, I thought, no one's ever going to listen to me. No one's ever going to care. Nobody really doesn't care about the practice side. And what I found is that it's not that people don't care. It's not that they're not interested. It's not, it's that that's not what they went to school for. It's they went to school to design. They went to school to do calculations or, or uh, construct great buildings. They didn't go to manage a business and they don't necessarily have the wherewithal or the skills and acumen to do that. But that's the part that I absolutely enjoy. So I started my own practice in April of 2006. And at that point in time decided I'm only going to focus on the practice. I'm only going to focus on primarily the strategy, um, whether that was business strategy or business development strategy. And over the last 10 years now, because uh, this April we, we will be in business 10 years, um, we have added uh, business resources in every discipline that runs the back office of a practice. And so we have experts in human resources, IT, graphics, marketing, business development, um, you, finance, accounting. Um, the only thing we don't have is legal, and that's fine with me. <laughs> I've got good friends that are great attorneys. I'll give you a great referral, but I don't want legal. Well, let's let's talk about this. You know, what are some of the common themes that you see with architecture firms in terms of underperformance or things that they're doing that that are inhibiting their really truly being a great practice? Wow, that's a big question. It is, but we have a little bit to talk about it, right? So, <laughs> so there are basically three buckets um, of what I call problems, and and most practice most practice problems fall into one of three areas. The the first big area is human resources. The second big area is marketing and business development. 
And the third big area is the money. And, and that really logically is the flow. Since this is an industry of ideas and innovation, it's not about making a widget. Um, ultimately, everything comes down to and hinges on the people. Uh, the development of them, the recruitment of them, long term, the retention of them, um, their development as leaders in some cases, or what we're really finding now, particularly with kind of the millennial and the Gen X and Gen Y uh, generation, is the lack of interest in, in general in, in assuming leadership roles, ownership roles more than anything. And so the human resource management piece is probably the largest and most complex single issue. The next issue is marketing and business development. And I would say that's kind of the Achilles heel for a lot of firms because I don't, with the exception of maybe 10% of the entire design population, most people just don't like doing it. Um, they feel like they're, number one, they feel like they're begging for, for, for work, and that's not the case. Um, number two, they don't like rejection. In, in general, my architect clients have rejection issues. And so when they hear no, they immediately shut down and they don't go back and, and ask for and develop relationships and develop work. And so there's a lot that we have to do in that space in order to get them to understand this is a business. And as a business, we need to develop work as a continuing core of who you are. And it's not a bad thing. It's It doesn't make you out to be a beggar. Um, and then the third impediment, of course, is, you know, the elephant in the room, managing the money. What, how are we profitable? What is profit? Um, and, and really trying to get that level of understanding down, not at the executive level where people generally tend to have it, but down to the project manager, the project architect, the job captain, so they understand their rework actually impacts the overall efficiency of the firm. Mm -hmm. Well, they, we got three big buckets there. Let's try to uh, dig as deep as we can in each one of those in the next okay. you know, 30 minutes or so. So. <laughs> So we start out with human resources, and I've, I'm, I'm hearing on the street that this is becoming more and more of a focus. You know, as, as work <laughs> is starting to roll in, it's like, okay, we got to get butts in the seat. We got to get the best talent. You know, tell me a little bit it's more. What, what exactly are the challenges that you mentioned some of them? Leadership, people wanting to take ownership positions. You know, what are firms really struggling with right now that you're working with in terms of the HR? So I think... The biggest issue, um, singular issue right now, is the identification of talent. Mm -hmm. I would be completely remiss at this point if I didn't acknowledge that there is just completely a talent shortage. Um, and that has a lot to do with the fact that the industry is performing better than it did three, four, five years ago when we could easily, more easily find people. But in general, it's trying to find the correct talent. Um, I, I am not a butt in seat fan, and, and by that I mean the following. I, I think a number of organizations spend a lot of time looking at the resumes of people and trying to suss out um, what is this person's technical experience relative to the technical requirements that I want them to do. The wheels really fall off the bus because a, as an industry, we don't know how to and don't spend time assessing competencies. Though that's a completely different skill set. But those are what people call soft skills, the ability to negotiate, the ability to communicate, empathize, um, lead, have judgment. Those are skills that people, you can't find on a resume. But by and large, the firms that are extremely successful have individuals that are not just knowledgeable or skills-based, but they are competent in these other areas. And so that's become, I think, an, a real key area for all organizations to really truly understand what is the difference between a skill and a competency? And then how do we assess whether or not an individual fits within our organization culturally? 
if we can do that, then we can basically engage them in long-term retention, which is the next biggest issue. We really need people to stay in firms, not just jump from organization to organization. And what we have found, interestingly enough, is that while people want and need, of course, to be compensated fairly, um, they're not le as likely to jump from firm to firm if they feel that they are being engaged, if they truly feel as though they are a contributing factor. And most of those contributions, believe it or not, aren't necessarily technical. They usually tend to be in the areas of competencies. Okay, so you mentioned one of the, the big challenges at the very at the very start here was the identification of the talent, mm -hmm. right? And so I want to dive in that a little bit more and try to figure out where it's breaking down. So, you know, if, we, if we're looking for talent, is it just that people aren't getting enough applications into the, the job postings they put out there? Is it more of a thing of trying to sort through the applications they are getting and make a short list? Or is it actually some other problem, like perhaps just being able to do a good interview and figure out who has those core competencies? Where is within that whole process, where would you say is sort of like the key problem that people are struggling with right now? I think the first problem is really and truly finding the people. Um, I think, and, and I've, I've heard this more anecdotally from colleagues of mine in architecture more so than colleagues of mine in engineering, who said, you know, we just don't have as many people, you know, in the practice, in the business. And so we're not getting the quality of individuals. We're not getting the volumes of people, just sheer numbers mm. that we used to get in you know, the early 2000s. So there is a volume number issue. So that's, that's the first piece. I think the second piece though, really has to do with what is actually being put on the resume. And then are, how are you doing the first screen of the resume in order to kind of delve a little bit deeper? Like I said, most people tend to focus on where did you go to school? What was your application? Um, show me the body of work that you've done. M my interest is more in, tell me about a project that you've collaborated on. Talk to me a little bit more about the process that you used. Those types of questions tend to be a little bit more engaging around the areas of competency and give you a window into how people tend to interact. Do they have judgment? Do they have integrity? Uh, do they work collaboratively? Do they communicate well? Those tend to be things, like I said, that you can't really see on a resume, unfortunately, but they t also tend to get overlooked. Um, so I have always tried to look at resumes and if there was a candidate who might have had something that kind of stuck out for me from a technical perspective. Go back to them and ask them some some questions to refine what they've given me. So you're talking about really a process of digging in uh, during the interview, being able to ask questions about the deal more with the soft skills, like you said, the collaboration, the et cetera. Yes. In terms of identifying people, it sounds like it's going to be a marketing exercise. It sounds like, you know, there are market forces at work here. There's competition for available, you know, the firms are now competing for the best talent. Uh, they have to be able to know how to get their message out, that they're hiring, and that there's a position, uh, the yes. culture of their firm. So they're marketing themselves to the potential applicants. Well, I think there's, I, but I think there's another phenomenon here. I think as an industry, we've all, whether we like it or not, we've all gotten used to the idea that we have to go look for work. We've all gotten used to that idea. We've all gotten used to the fact that, okay, we're going to go to a conference or we're going to go to a networking event or whatever it happens to be, and we're going to try and, and meet who we need to meet. I have long been a subscriber of, I need to look for people as hard as I need to look for work, because that's the only way I'm really going to be able to assess someone's competencies. So me personally, 
Um, I have always advocated for our clients when you are going to a professional conference. Now, I'm not talking about a business development conference. I'm going to set that aside. But when you're going to go to a conference like a convention, an AIA convention or an ACEC convention, to me, those are the best places to look for people. Not because they're walking around with a sign that says, you know, we'll work for food or we'll design for food, but you have an opportunity to actually engage with those individuals, talk to them and understand what is their thinking process? What is their collaborative process? And and that's really when you get to begin to know someone. It's really very difficult to know off of just a piece of paper. So the best hires, do they happen in this, I'm going to call that the hidden job market, right? People that aren't necessarily looking. These are sort of relationships that are built up over time. And, you know, I'm, I'm definitely an advocate of that. But would you say the best hires happen through that kind of process or is the equally valid, the typical, you know, send in your resume kind of process? I would honestly say that it really kind of happens in what you call the hidden job market. Because number one, when somebody posts a job, in order for you to get a resume, that individual has to be looking. Sometimes the best talent isn't necessarily looking. If an opportunity presents itself, for leadership or development, the opening of a different service line or geogra geographic area or region, that might actually spark interest. But by and large, that person isn't waking up every morning going, I need to look for a job. So within the context of the realm of people that I usually tend to want to hire, they're not necessarily looking. They're, they're already somewhere else, maybe happy, Oftentimes not, you just don't know because no one's ever asked them. And it's really more about trying to engage them around, well, what do you see yourself doing? Where do you want to go? And really trying to make that connection in much the same way that we make the connection for work. Are we making the same connection to try and identify people? Have you thought about starting your own practice or are you looking to take your practice to the next level? If so, I wanted to let you know that free registration for the 2016 Architecture Business Plan Competition opens on December 1st, 2015. Start your planning process now and enter for a chance to win a grand prize of $10,000. Five finalists will be flown to Philadelphia to present their full plans to four industry-leading jurors. Travel and lodging are provided. So this is a one-of-a-kind competition. It's open to all licensed architects in the United States and Canada who are planning to start a new firm within one year or currently own a firm that is less than 10 years old. Visit archbusinessplan.com to learn more. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. Views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.